Well, hello everybody. Welcome to RTTV. This is episode 18 and I am so excited because today we have one of our favorite guest stars coming back, Anna Marie Evans. She is a professional editor. She is in acquisitions and she is all around amazing. She was here once with us before, but today we are back to drill down really deep into something we touched on in her last episode, and we're going to be talking about the science of a synopsis. So we're breaking down everything you need to know about writing a synopsis and using that within your author brand, whether it is to go to your editors or to your publishers, or you are sending it to someone like me because you are coming on one of my shows. So we're breaking down everything you need to know today and we're gonna be able to answer your questions at the very end so let's not waste any more time we're gonna jump in with our intro and then we'll bring Anna on welcome to RT TV brought to you by reading transforms with your host KM Robinson of KM Robinson photography and reading transforms if you look to the right of your screen, you will note a chat box. We encourage you to ask questions and comment throughout the show. Our moderators will be watching the feed and collecting questions for our hosts to answer during the end of the broadcast. Use the red question mark tab to differentiate your questions from your comments in the feed. If you are a member of our Facebook community and our weekly newsletter, your notes will be emailed to you shortly. Make sure that you are active this week in our Facebook community for deeper insights into how to apply this into your marketing strategy and for ongoing support. Welcome to the weekly live broadcast that will revolutionize your author branding, book marketing, and social media marketing strategies. Okay, we are going to bring her on. Anna, welcome back to RGTV. How are you today? Hi, I'm doing really well. I'm really excited to be back. Um, I hope, hope that everybody can get a lot out of this presentation and I think it's going to be a good one. So. I think it's going to be fantastic. I know that I personally have got a lot of inquiries from fans specifically on writing a synopsis and specifically on having you back to talk about it because we got a lot out of your last episode. So I don't want to waste a ton of time talking about your last episode, but guys, if you have not seen it yet, it was from our premiere week. Make sure you jump back and you check out on his uh, first episode all about querying and how to use that within your author brand, whether you're dealing with publishers or editors or agents or something else like that. There's a ton of information that's super valuable. Make sure you check that out. But today we're going to drill down on one thing we touched on within that episode, and that is writing our synopsis. So Anna, start us off. What do we need to know? Well, a lot. Um, the biggest thing I think that everybody's going to find is that writing the synopsis is really not very fun. Um, I've never heard anybody complain about really any part of the query process as much as I hear people complain about writing the synopsis. Um, so it's, it's pretty difficult. Um, and unfortunately, it's really important. So everybody has to do it. And you just kind of have to sit down, you know, buckle down and actually write it. So I'm hoping that I can give um, some advice that'll make it a little bit less painful. Um, otherwise, you just kind of have to hold your nose and jump in. Um, so, I mean, do you have anything that you want to start off with, or should we just jump right in? You know, I'm really excited to learn all about the synopsis. I know a little bit because you and I have chatted before, um, but I know that you've actually got a really good suggestion for where to start. So why don't you go ahead and let us know what's the very first thing we need to be worried about when writing a synopsis? Okay, well, um, I think at first you need to know what you're doing. Um, <laughs> you need to know <laughs> the, the basics of what a synopsis is and why people are looking for them. Um, so I think the, the basic definition that everybody is going to think of when they think of a synopsis is it's a summary of your book, um, which is true. And it's got to include all of your major characters, all of your plot points, um, things like the, the W questions, who, what, when, where, why. Um, and it's intended to, to present the events of your book for somebody who's looking to work on it. Um, a trap that a lot of authors fall into, which I think is really important to bring up in the beginning, is that a synopsis is not an extension of your query. It's not a long query letter. You're not intending to market your book. You're not intending to raise more interest and make people want to go and read your manuscript. Um, it's just about providing answers. Um, if you're raising questions in your synopsis, that's bad. Um, if you are 
trying to you know leave out key points and saying read the book to find this out that's bad because the reason that we ask for a synopsis in a query um that a lot of agents and editors will ask for a synopsis is so that we can know up front that all of the content in the book is something that we want to work on um i have had submissions in the past that um i've bent the rules and not had a synopsis for and then I spend all of this time reading the book and find out at the end that it's not going to be a good fit. And it's something that, that we really want to know right away. Um, and the synopsis is, is the best way to do that. Now, a lot of people also will not ask for a synopsis in the query, but it's common enough that you, you really should have it um, if you're getting ready to submit your book anywhere regardless. Yeah, that's a great point. And like I had mentioned before, a synopsis is not necessarily just for your editor or your agent or your publisher, but even if you do not need that for those people, you will need it for other things like interviews, like when you come on shows like RTTV or Young Adult Edition, so that I know what we're talking about when we start to interview you and speak with you about your book. So having a synopsis, whether your publisher requires you to have one or not, is really important so that you are ready to go when something comes up that you actually need it for. Now, talk to me a little bit about what the next step is. We know what a synopsis is, and we know why it's important, but what's next? Um, I mean, just getting started is next, making sure that you have the right content to put in there um, and you're not, you know, vomiting up details that you don't need in your synopsis and that you still get all the important points. Um, I think the one of the worst things you can do with a synopsis is leave something important out so that whoever you're submitting to or um, your interviewer or your book blogger um, reads your synopsis, knows what to expect, and then they get to the book and there's a whole point of view character that you never mentioned in your synopsis that raises a couple questions first of all why are you leaving them out in the first place if you have called them important enough to you know be worthy of their own point of view in the book shouldn't they be important enough to the story to include in the synopsis that kind of stuff um, so there are just I don't know there there are a whole bunch of little details I think that people don't think about when writing a synopsis um, and I definitely want to go through sort of what to include what not to include um, and I think I think that's perfect if we could go through everything that we need to include and definitely what not to include because sometimes people go over things and they just say have these things but they neglect to tell us that there are specific things that aren't necessarily required or appreciated within it and people will just pop it in there because we assume and so when we give both of those it's really gonna help so I know you've got a couple of things for us as far as what to include so tell me a little bit I know we've got some fun lettery things so talk to me lettery things all right those are the W questions that I mentioned at the beginning and that would be the who what when where why um, I mean the biggest uh, two are going to be the who and the what. Um, so we'll start with the who, which would be the main characters with a high impact on your story. Um, it needs to include every character that has a point of view in the book, even if it's just for like half of a chapter, you have deemed them important enough to see from their perspective. And we also need to know why that's important to the story. Where is that leading the story? Um, so you can also include important secondary characters. Um, should include important secondary characters. So like your main character's best friend and their impact on the story. Um, as far as like tertiary characters, it's a probably an outdated term at this point. Um, you, you don't need to talk about every single character that appears in your book. You don't need to go into detail about your main character's cousin who shows up once in a phone call about Thanksgiving dinner. We just don't need to know that. Um, but if there's a character who has a significant impact on the direction of the plot, we really need to hear about them. Um, and then obviously the what is going to be the plot itself, um, which this is what the synopsis really needs to focus on. You need to include all the characters, but the synopsis is the plot. Um, you can think about it as like you're writing an, an essay that's like a book report on your own book. Um, if you can go back to the middle school and high school days, because um, <laughs> that's lots of fun, right? Everybody wants to do that. Oh, absolutely. Um, so basically, 
basically um, a synopsis needs to include your story's full arc. Um, it's the most important part of the synopsis content um, and you need to think of it like you're, you're walking your reader, your, whoever you're submitting to through your story um, as if you were you know, taking them through the journey of your book. Um, I'm sure everybody has seen at some point the the diagrams of plot that are like an arc that I think with my camera would go like this way. <laughs> um, and it, it would be, you would draw a line, you'd find your major plot points. Um, if you haven't found that diagram, it's good, good to find. Um, and you would place them on the, the rising and falling action scale and the timeline and all of that good stuff. And then you would write a summary of that. Um, maybe like one sentence per plot point, um, a little bit of that. Um, and you, you really need to include every plot twist. I think that's a really good scale to have one sentence per plot point so that you don't talk too much, but you also make sure you get everything in. So that's a really great little reminder. I feel like it's gonna be a little clip on our social media later on this week. Right, and and kind of to ex expand on that, if you're doing one line per plot point, um, as you go through, and, and this is kind of like a, a first draft of the synopsis guide, as you go through and you're revising your synopsis and making sure that it's final, um, there are going to be some plot points that are going to warrant more, there are going to be some that maybe you can combine in a sense with another because they're just minor. Um, all of that good stuff. So I think that um, it's it's a good place to start just to make sure that you know all of those major plot points that need to go in the synopsis. Yeah, I think that's fantastic and a really way, great way to gauge that. So some will be a little more, some will be a little less, but that's about average in what you should be looking at as you are first starting to write it. So fantastic advice. Right. Um, so the when and the where. Here's where we're getting into the still important but slightly less important of these questions. Um, you do want to introduce your setting, introduce your world a little bit, but you cannot overload the synopsis with world building. Um, that's the job of the opening sequence of your book. If you're writing an epic fantasy and you've built this amazing world, I know you want to share it with me, but you just need to introduce it as in this world, give us the names, maybe give us the name of a city, and um, tell us where your character fits into it, but not in a way that you're actually trying to tell a story with the world at this moment, because um, it's just it's just not the place for it. Um, and you do need to talk about, like, I guess I talk about fantasy a lot because I'm a fantasy reader and I'm a fantasy writer. Um, but if you're if you're writing a book that's set in our world, um, maybe you need to tell us that it's set in Chicago, so that when reading your synopsis, we don't read, we don't move on to your book expecting to see you know Montana in there or something. Um, and I, I think that that's a detail that a lot of people seem to leave out because they get so focused on the the who and the what. Um, but it is it is important to include a little bit about your settings so that we have an expectation going from your synopsis to your book. That's fantastic advice. I really like that because, like you said, people do get really focused on that who and that what. And sometimes we neglect to mention other things that really are going to set those expectations. So I really love that. That was fantastic. Definitely. Um, as far as the when, uh, if you're writing a book that's set now, you don't need to mention the when because that's going to be the, the assumption when we're reading a synopsis that it's going to be a modern story in our world and if it's different that's what you need to tell us so if it's integral to your plot do mention the when of your setting so if you're writing a historical novel uh, if you're writing a Christmas novel or a summer road trip novel if you're writing a futuristic sci-fi you do need to talk about the the moment in time that we're seeing here as well um, to go back to the fantasy example, if you're writing like a medieval fantasy, uh, it's probably something you can get across with your wear, um, unless you have, for some reason, you know, a, a very specific reason to um, share the when in your timeline. But those are interesting little side points, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> we like side points. Side points are very valuable. Yes, should be good. Um, and then I think the most complicated part that a lot of people seem to leave out um, would be the why and the how of these questions. Um, for each plot point, there's obviously something causing it. Um, you can think of your entire story as a series of cause to effect, hopefully. Um, 
and you can include a bit of a bit of the why, a bit of um, you know what caused this, what what character motivation set this event in motion. Um, don't do it to a point that you're you know over characterizing your characters and it's drowning the plot because we know so much of the why. Um, I think it's a delicate balance. It's something you would just have to write a first draft to do and and look it over, have some friends look it over, and. Um, all that kind of stuff. I think a tip that I would use for a, a first draft of a synopsis um, would be to use the words in order to. So if you're trying to introduce the next part of your plot, let's say in order to um, get the main male character to go on a date with her, she did this. Um, and I, I think obviously you don't want to use that for everything in order to but if you're writing a first draft and you're struggling um, you can do that and then you can revise it out later um, obviously you want to make it sound prettier you don't want to overload words um, but you, you do want to get a little bit of reasoning because we want to get to know um, what's causing all of the events in your story not just that they're happening I feel like that's a really great motivational tool if you have that in order to phrase that really suggests where you should be going and you can kind of dictate what you are writing from there and then like you said take it out and really revise that later use different wording but it gives you that direction to move along within what you're writing yeah absolutely and if a character or an entity in your book is doing something and you can't sum up the motivation with in order to you might actually want to look back at your manuscript and see if that event itself is actually flushed out enough that's a fantastic point. When you are writing the synopsis, it really can help you to pinpoint problem areas that you might want to go back and check or just develop a little bit more or just a little bit differently so that you really have it fine-tuned to what you need to do with it. Absolutely. Um, so that covers the, the fun letter stuff. <laughs> um, are you making I, fun I, of me, Anna? <laughs> right? I, a little bit, maybe. <laughs> We can do this because we're friends, guys. It's okay. <laughs> okay, so let's move on. Um, we dealt with all of our fun letter stuff because I didn't want to give it away, Anna. And, <laughs> and we are going to move on. Um, tell me, what is the next thing we want to chat about with this? Okay, so the next thing I think is going to be story building basics. Um, going back to if you remember you know have you ever written a short story in elementary school what did they teach you your story needs a beginning a middle and an end so does your synopsis you need to have the beginning obviously you need to have the ending obviously and you really need to have the middle um i think everybody here is interested enough in writing that they've probably done some of their own research they've learned a lot about writing their book and everybody's heard of the saggy middle it's easy to write a beginning because you're, you're setting up your call to action and everything's gonna be really fun and everything's gonna stem from this moment. And then it's easy to write the ending because this is the point you've all been waiting for. But when it comes to the middle and the events that get you from A to C, I think people tend to lose B. And that's true of books and it's also true of a synopsis. Um, you can't really go from setup, so uh, you're introducing your characters, you're introducing your world and um, here's the, the first event and the first motivation and then one thing led to another and suddenly we're at the ending. Uh, we really need to have a fleshed out middle. We need to hear about those plot points. Um, you, you don't want the synopsis equivalent of the saggy middle. It will not help sell your book. It's going to make me think that, um, so if I, if I receive a synopsis that's got, you know, the saggy middle and I read it with the intent of maybe acquiring it, I'm going to then expect to go into your book and see that same saggy middle represented there. Even if that's not true, you still have to represent it well in the synopsis. That's a good point. A synopsis is really short, and so you have to pack a lot of punch into this really short place where you're writing your story. And if you do not convey that well, it's not going to translate very well for you, especially if they are looking to acquire your book. So really show off your knowledge, especially within that middle part, to keep their attention throughout the entire thing. Right, Anna? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's definitely, it's, I mean, like I said, it's not a marketing tool, but it's something that you, we need to know what's going on. And if you're going into one thing led to another, you've already lost that. 
Yeah, absolutely. I feel like we're, we're, as we're talking about this, you had mentioned this is not a marketing tool. And I think that's a really good point because a lot of people think that this is something they have to use to hook people with, but it's not. It's very informational. So your mindset when you go into this really needs to be that you are selling them this book as a whole book, not to get them hooked to see if maybe they'll like it, but really pitch it within this particular synopsis so that they can see everything that you've done in a short condensed form to know whether or not that's something they want to read in depth. So if you go into it with a mindset of marketing it, it's not going to work for you. But if you go into that mindset that this is informational, this is something they need to make a decision about you, that's really going to help in how you're writing it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that this is another place where we can actually apply the one sentence per plot point thing as well, because that way you're making sure that you get everything in there and everything fits. Um, and also that you're, you're touching on those things in the middle so you're not losing track of your potential reader, potential uh, buyer, I guess. Yeah, fantastic. Now, I know we've just talked about the middle a little bit. I want to talk a little bit more about the endings because I know this is a big deal within a synopsis because a lot of people don't necessarily put that ending in there. So what do we need to know about the ending within our synopsis? Okay, so you have to include it. Um, I think a lot of people approach a synopsis as like an extended second query. Uh, if you don't include the end, there's really no point to the synopsis and it just has become another query, which is not what I want. I want to know the ending straight, straight away. Um, I don't want to be left with rhetorical questions. Uh, will she get the guy? I want to know that in the synopsis. Um, and, and you know, it's, hit or miss on certain agents and editors, whether they will want the ending in the actual query, um, but everybody needs an ending in the synopsis. Um, and if you wanna include a little bit about, you know, the event that finally set in motion the ending or the effects of the ending on your main character afterward, that's great detail as well, um, but we really just need to know what happens. Is there a happily ever after or is this Romeo and Juliet? So, very good point. Now, as we are writing our synopsis, we are keeping in mind all the things that we need to include. We know we have that beginning, middle, and end. Talk to me a little bit about how we are writing this. Is there a particular voice we should be writing this in, or is it kind of just anything goes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I think the tips that we've talked about so far have been on the level of a first draft of a synopsis and then you would you'd sort of flesh it out from there. And while you're writing your synopsis, while you're revising your synopsis and getting to that point where it is fleshed out, um, you, you should be thinking about the voice that's in your book. Um, while you're not writing your synopsis as an actual story, there should still be some of your voice. Um, like if the tone of your book is set by a snarky teenager, your synopsis should not read like it's you know, written academically, it needs to have a little bit of that snark. It needs to tell me that going into this book, I'm going to expect to see this character speaking this way. Um, it's basically, you're just priming me for reading the book, essentially. And um, I know voice is really difficult um, when it comes to doing it deliberately. A lot of people have an author voice that they just have, which is fantastic. Um, a lot of people's characters have strong voices that they just have. And translating that to a synopsis can be really difficult. Um, I think the best way to approach it would, would be to use the same in order to motivations. Um, tell us why your character is doing something and tell us about your character through that. Because anybody can you know, go to town to get their car fixed because they're sick of having a flat tire, but why do you, I, I guess that's a terrible example because why are you driving on a flat tire? But um, you need to talk about maybe maybe they're extra frustrated about it and it's been just such a bad day that it shows up in the tone that they're frustrated while you're writing about it. Um, I know easier said than done, but that's just something that comes with, with I think redrafting and writing the synopsis as, as a cohesive unit, so a very good point. Hey, quick question. About how many times should we be redrafting this synopsis? Is this something that we should write once and just revise once and be done? Or is this something that's, you know, different between each individual? How many times on average should we take a look at this and really work on it? 
I think it's definitely going to be based on the individual. Um, there are some people who have, you know, published 20 books, and at this point they just do a synopsis because it's a formality and they have to do it, um, and they will do a first draft and then write another one. Or even just send in their first draft. Don't do that. I would not recommend that. Um, but a lot of people, especially writers who have um, maybe only done one or two books or are new to the query process in general, um, should really look at revising the synopsis more than once, having people beta read it, like you have people beta read your manuscript. Um, make sure that your friends who've read your book aren't reading your synopsis and saying, but what about this point? Or friends who have read your book aren't reading your synopsis and saying, I don't remember this being in the book. Or maybe friends who have not read your book are reading your synopsis and they don't come back to you with questions about what you've written. Um, I mean, I, I'm a huge advocate for writing groups, critique groups, um, always, always get a beta reader. And I, that includes not just your manuscript, but your synopsis, your query, all of that kind of stuff. So would you almost recommend maybe having someone who has not read your story yet to read your synopsis first and then read your story and make sure it all lines up? Is that something that you might consider or recommend to people? Or do you really yeah. think it should be afterwards? I do think that that would help as well. Um, I think there are just a million options when it comes to having people review your stuff. Um, as long as you're, you're actively seeking these people out, you'll always be able to find them. Um, having somebody do that, if you can get somebody to dedicate the time to that, um, I think that would be valuable as well. Um, the problem that I think a lot of people would see in that is that you've spent all of this time writing your book and having people beta read that, and now just for a two-page synopsis, you're having somebody read your entire book again. Um, but I think if you can find somebody who will do it, it definitely would be valuable. Fantastic. Okay, so we've talked about everything we need to include within our synopsis. Is there anything else we haven't touched on for including before we move on to the things that we should not be including? Um, I mean, as far as things to include, I think we've touched on all the major things, like you've said, um, your characters, your plot are the, the big things, and then the details that get us from A to B to C. Um, I, think, I think we can definitely move on and talk about what to leave out, what to not do with your synopsis, because um, this is my favorite part. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I like that too, because that makes your life easier. You are a professional editor, you are in acquisitions, and so you do this on a daily basis. This is your job. This is your life. So you really know what's important to have within our synopsis wording and what is important to keep out so that we do not overrun you with words and thoughts and things that you don't necessarily need to know within a synopsis. So let's talk about those things we do not need. Yeah, absolutely. The biggest trap that I think people fall into, which I mentioned in, in the what to do section, is including way too many characters. You don't need to talk about your, your main character's cousin who you talk to once on the phone. Um, it doesn't really matter that um, maybe your main character has a sister who is living across the country and she thinks about her every once in a while, but she's not actually present in the story. Unless she's a major motivator for his actions, we don't really need to hear about her, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm actually gonna pull from one of my examples that we're gonna go over later in the presentation and talk about, um, I, I wanted to pick something that really wouldn't get spoiled for hopefully anybody, um, and that would be Harry Potter. Um, so when you look at the Harry Potter series as a whole, there are so many characters and you wouldn't really want to include all of them in an introduction to the first book, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Um, you would just want to talk about your main characters, your Harry, Ron, and Hermione, you'd have Dumbledore, McGonag McGonagall, Hagrid, all that kind of stuff. Um, but you probably don't want to talk about Lavender Brown until book six when she becomes a major character in one of our main characters' lives. Um, you don't want to you don't want to overload people with characters and so i'm not sitting there saying wait what role does this character play that's important to the story why are they mentioned now i'm confused and then they show up as a tiny character in the book and i'm like i expected so much more um i think that's really off-putting and i think a lot of people do that so. that's a very good point you want to make sure that you are only getting those main people in there because if they just have a small part that really is confusing, isn't it? For someone to come in and read the synopsis and then be looking for them within the story and they are only there for a little bit. So I feel like that's very good advice. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, and kind of in that vein, maybe small plot points that don't matter. Um, if your character, okay, <laughs> that's it's totally contradictory because we've talked about one sentence per plot point. If you have something tiny that happens, like your character makes a detour to the bathroom at some point. I don't know why you're writing that, but whatever. Um, <laughs> Maybe we don't need to know about it in the synopsis because um, we don't really need a play-by-play. -play. It's not a football game. It's more of the the newspaper write-up of the football game afterward, if that makes sense, hopefully. Uh, like, it doesn't matter that your main character met her best friend in a bathroom a year ago. It only matters that this best friend is present and that she is the main character's best friend. So you would talk about, you know, Main character is, let's call her Emma. So Emma's best friend, Sarah, shows up here. Not Emma's best friend, Sarah, who Emma has known forever, shows up here. Because we don't really need to know that. We just need to know what's her relationship to the main character, why is she a player on this field? That's a good point. I feel like we can also point out that you don't want a lot of extra words. Um, and a little bit later on, we're going to be talking about the size and the word count and the limits that we have on a synopsis. And if you have these extra words like she's known her forever, that just kind of takes away from your word count or your limit. And that doesn't work in your favor. You definitely want to be concise with it. Um, it's not about flowery words unless you're writing something super literary and the whole point of your book is flowery words. Um, in that case, <laughs> good luck to you. But anyway. Um, I, I mean, I think that's a that's a really good point. We don't want to overload just extra unnecessary information because it takes away space from the important things later on. Yeah, I think that's definitely something that's good to consider as we're writing our synopsis. So talk to me a little bit about some of those other things that we don't need because maybe they will take up space. I know you have something that you want to talk to us specifically about, and I don't want to read it, so go ahead, tell us what your next point is. Okay, so one thing that you definitely want to leave out is your opinion. Um, you, as the author, are, unless you're writing something in this style, um, you're not injecting your own opinion and your own voice into the story. You're just writing the story. So if your main character's friend dies, I mean, that sucks a lot and that's going to be really sad. But don't say something like, sadly, or in a sad scene this person dies because we know that's sad that's implied um, we don't want to hear that you're approaching this as a sad scene we just want to experience it if that makes sense hopefully that's no that's a very good point because as an author writing a synopsis your job is to get the information out not to tell them how to feel about it so exactly. people can understand what you're saying and what you're setting up within your scenes they understand if something is sad or something is happy you don't need to tell them how to feel that's not your job with a synopsis definitely because ideally your writing as a whole is going to dictate how people feel without having to be told how to feel exactly um, that's an extremely yeah. good point you just don't ever want to editorialize your your synopsis. You want to treat it as if these are real events, this is what's happening. Um, so in that in that vein, you also don't want to talk about the technical aspect of writing it. Um, you don't want to say, in this scene, this happens, and then in another scene, someone else does this. Because then you're, you're acknowledging that this is a written story and that it's broken down by scenes. Um, you kind of just want to say, this happens, and then this happens. Um, so it, it's it's sort of the equivalent of, in your manuscript, a piece of writing that would take your reader out of the story for a moment and make them stop reading, which is bad. So. That is such a fantastic point. I love that within a synopsis, you are not supposed to acknowledge that this is a story. You're just telling what it is. So instead of saying in this scene where you were acknowledging that this is a story, you just tell it. And I love that because it really helps with the mindset that you need going into writing the synopsis so that you're not throwing in all these extra things so that you're not throwing your uh, own personal thoughts on what's happening into it. I love that because it really helps to streamline and focus what you need to be delivering through the synopsis. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's the same mindset that people should be in while actually writing their book. Um, you never want to take your reader out and make them think that it's a story that they're reading. You want them to live it. So that's amazing. I love that. That's totally going to be one of those things I clip up and put on social media. <laughs> hey, awesome. <laughs> we got so many good quotables from you. We just love having you on because I can spice Aww. things up and put it everywhere. And then, and I'm just going to say this, guys, because I can. I get a ton of social media likes and comments on all of our clips of Anna because she is so knowledgeable and so good at what she does. And she's so good about telling us what to do and how to do it in a way that is understandable and relatable. So, yay, Anna points to you. Well, thank you. I love points. Do the points <laughs> matter here? Is this, this is exciting. All right, I'm collecting points. Um, <laughs> Yes, we're going to keep score and you're just going to be like, we're, we're going to give you an award at the end of this because you'll have the most points. <laughs> All right. I've won the house cup. Um, but anyway, I, I mean, I think I'm really glad to be here and I'm really glad to be able to help people. And I'm actually thrilled to hear that, that people have liked to listen to me. So. Oh, yeah. I've gotten so many comments on your, your episodes and your clips and the things that you have to say. It's awesome. I would have you here every week if I could. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> I don't know if I can schedule that. Do you have all that content? Can we make that happen, Anna? <laughs> maybe. Maybe down the road. Um, but we'll, have, we'll have it on like a monthly basis. Write in, guys. Go ahead in the chat box right now over on the right side. Go ahead and let us know what other topics you want to hear from Anna. If you are not going to type them into the chat box right now, and you are more than welcome to, but go ahead and send us a message. So if you are watching our rebroadcast and you would like more advice from Anna in terms of editing and anything to do with acquisitions, she is our girl. Let me know what you're struggling with right now, and we will work on an episode for the next year so that we are, because right now, if you are watching a rebroadcast, we are at the end of 2016. This is actually our last episode before 2017. So let us know what you want to see in 2017 from Anna. We will make sure we get her back. Now, we actually need to get back on track because I totally sidetracked us there. <laughs> I like That's to do okay. that. I know um, we just talked about keeping your opinion out of things. There is another thing I want to talk about within that, and that is rhetorical questions. So talk to me. Should we be putting those in there that kind of hints about what people should be thinking or questions that they should be asking as they are reading this? Uh, no. Uh, basically, if you're, if you're putting in a rhetorical question or a question that's intended to make your reader stop and think, you don't want to do that. Um, Unless, say, a rhetorical question is actually part of your character's voice that you're trying to portray through your synopsis, that's fine. Um, but if you're doing it with the intent to make your, your whoever your reader is, move on to your manuscript and look for the answer to it, um, that's that's bad because you want your synopsis, like I said, to just be just information. You don't want to make your reader have to read your book to find out more. Um, you want somebody to read your book because they now want to read your writing. They want to see this story fully fleshed out. Um, points that are intended to raise questions are going to kind of bring a halt to that and will say, wait, but you need to give me the answers here and all you've given me is another question. So, so basically a synopsis should answer all of your questions. There should be no right. questions within a synopsis. Correct. Um, it should provide answers and not provide more questions. Fantastic. All right. So have we covered everything that we should not be putting into our synopsis and we're ready to move on? Um, you know, I think so. A lot of what to leave out is also going to be subjective. It's going to be part, partly about your story, about you as a writer, and about feedback that you would get from readers of your synopsis. Um, so you're always going to want to take these tips and, and Employ them to the best of your ability, but, you know, don't kill yourself over them. Just do, do the best you can, and from there, find out what works specifically for you. Um, writing is a subjective business. You have already written a story that you hopefully love. Um, if you don't, what are you doing? And you need to, you need to translate that to the rest of, of what you do. Um, as far as a synopsis, it just while you're revising, while you're getting people to help you write it. Um, if you find that one of these tips isn't working for you, take it out. That's okay. Um, it's all going to be just what works best for you. Fantastic. Okay. So we just talked about your favorite part, what to leave out. I want to talk about my favorite part. This is what I'm most 
most interested in, and that is the format for this. So how exactly should we be formatting our synopsis? Are there rules to this? Are there generalizations to this? Or is it kind of just whatever we feel like? Okay, it's definitely not whatever you feel like, unfortunately. Um, as far as the formatting, the really technical stuff, um, the biggest thing that you're going to want to look at is it's going to be, you know, typical manuscript format, which is, you know, industry standard is size 12 font, Times New Roman or Courier, double spaced, you know, one inch margins, all of that good stuff. Um, if you're, whoever you're submitting to has different guidelines, follow their guidelines before you follow industry standard. But that's going to be a, a pretty safe way to do it. Um, it needs to be written like an essay. So each paragraph should be, I wrote in my notes one plot point, which is bad. Um, that's wrong. And each paragraph should be one major, I guess, sequence of plot points. Um, if you think about it in your beginning, middle, and end, you can start off by maybe writing three total very long paragraphs and then splitting those up based on what's relevant to what. Um, if you think back to, oh gosh, probably middle school when you were writing the essays and they'd have your topic paragraph and then your first body paragraph would have its topic sentence and then its transition and then its examples um, and then you'd highlight those in different colors. If you can do that with your synopsis, that'll actually really help out with your format. What are the most important points? What are the cause to effect? Make sure those are in the same paragraph, all of that kind of stuff. So. so shout out to our sixth grade teachers for educating us well. <laughs> Yes. Oh my gosh. That's some nostalgia. Uh, <laughs> we should do a whole episode on that. Things we learned in elementary school and middle school that will help you in your writing career. And the shocking things that lots of people don't know, like punctuation. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I love that. I feel like I feel yes. like we need to make this happen. Okay. Let's go just, back to here basics we come. Here. <laughs> All right. So yeah, definitely. Um, Prioritize your submission guidelines from there on. Um, it's just going to be about making it look professional, all that good stuff. Um, I think one of the most important things when it comes to writing a synopsis, obviously, is going to be the word count limit. Um, everybody who is asking for a synopsis usually will have a word count limit imposed. When I'm looking for submissions, I don't really care about the word count of your synopsis so long as it's not like 20 pages long. It's going to take all of my time. Um, just, you know, if you can keep it short and sweet, that's better. Um, a lot of people will ask for a uh, specific length. I'm sorry, I have to hiccup. <laughs> that's okay. I actually have a great question to fill the time, and that would be, is there something that is considered too long for a synopsis? So if they don't give you any regulations, is there a point where it's just too much? Yeah, I would say um, if you have no guidelines for submission, try to keep it like three pages or under. Uh, beyond that, unless you really, you know, your book is really long and it's really rich with plot points and you just have to go over and then, and also regarding you have to not have been told to keep it under a certain length, then I guess you could push that limit a little bit, but I think a safe limit would be three pages or less. Um, Perfect. So talk to me about the typical limits. When people do give specific guidelines to this, what are the ones that we are typically looking at? Okay, um, so I guess typically you'd either be looking at people giving you a word count limit or a page limit. And so some common common ones there are going to be a one-page synopsis or a three-page synopsis. Um, another one would be 300 words, 500 words, 600 words. Um, I would say probably don't go above 600. That would probably be the, the equivalent of the three-page um, double space, all that good stuff. Um, so. One tip that I have um, regarding this is before you start submitting, write a few different copies of your synopsis in those different lengths. Um, it'll just have to be, you know, how much detail can you include? How many minor plot points can you include? Do you really need to just strip it down to its bare bones? Main character does this because this, this happens. Um, and that's what you're going to find in like a one page synopsis because that's barely any space, but so many people will ask for that. Um, so my, my suggestion would be to take those one page, three page, 300 word, 500 word, and write a synopsis that, um, you have a version of it for each of those. And that way, no matter what your, um, 
no matter what who you're submitting to is asking for, you have something that's going to be, you know, in the ballpark. So if you've been given guidelines to submit a two-page synopsis, it would probably, and you, and you, okay, so if you've been given guidelines to submit a two-page synopsis and all you have is a three-page synopsis, it's going to be hard to pare it down because you've settled on this three pages. This is what I need to include. But if you have a one page synopsis as well, it'd probably be easier to expand the one page into two pages. And that way you have some more to work with. That's a good point. Now, as you're writing these, and you did suggest that we do have a list of these so that we've got all the different sizes ready to go. Would you recommend that you start small and then work to the bigger? Or would you suggest we start with that three page and then pair back? And I'm pretty sure I know your answer to this, but go ahead and give it to me. Um, you know, I would actually say that it's going to be subjective. I think a lot of people um, think of it like a, like a different writing style when you're actually writing your book. If you have a style where you like to just outline your your points and your first draft ends up being, you know, just a, a skeleton of your your second draft and then your revisions include going in and adding. It might be better to start with a one page synopsis and then work up from there. But if you're like me and your first draft includes a lot of word vomit and most of your revision is about cutting down, maybe you should start with the longer one. That's a very good point. I didn't actually consider that. So that's great. However you work best, that is what you should be working with and then add or take away from there. Fantastic. So what else do we need to know as far as tips for writing a synopsis? Okay. So um, to kind of go more on the technical writing side, um, your synopsis always needs to be in third person, regardless of whether your book is in first person. You don't want to have your, your teenage girl character narrating your synopsis with I. Um, I think that's a little bit awkward. It's going to be off-putting to people, and it's going to color the events of the synopsis and make us wonder whether this is actually what's going on in the story, or is this what the character wants us to think? And that's a question. You don't want to raise questions. <laughs> um, it also always needs to be in present tense, regardless of the tense in your book, um, because we want to be just walking through it really quickly. Um, this is something that honestly has been just one of those must do's forever. And I could not tell you why it started. I, I don't know really the reasoning behind it. It's just, it's how it is and reading it any differently now honestly sounds wrong. So <laughs> it's got to be third person, present tense. Um, one other tip would be maybe put your character names in all caps on the first mention um, or, or bold them or make them stand out in some way. So that way, when you're first introducing a character who comes in at the end of the book and you put it in all caps, we know, okay, this is when this character enters the playing field and we're not stuck going back to the beginning of the synopsis like, wait, who is this guy? Where did I miss him? So... I think that's, that's a very good point. And you brought that up during your last episode. And I loved that because I had no idea until you mm -hmm. said that on air. I did not know that that was a thing. And that's really good because it draws your attention to it. And it is, you know, with the understanding that this is the first time you're seeing them, that you don't have to go look back and raise more questions. Because again, with a synopsis, we are not raising questions for answering everything. Right, right, definitely. And it's a, it's a personal favorite tip of mine because it drives me crazy when people don't do it, so. And I feel like oh, not yeah. a lot of people know that either. I feel like that's something that's, that's not talked about a lot, so I feel like that is one of those things that I like to talk about a lot now because now I know it's a thing. I didn't know it was a thing before. And it, it's definitely so helpful to people writing and people reading them. So I highly appreciate that tip. Yeah, definitely. Um, so as far as examples, I mean, I think I touched on earlier, you know, when to mention certain characters in a synopsis. And I actually have a few different copies of um, synopses for Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone from different sources. Um, and it's interesting to kind of compare and contrast them. If it's a book you're familiar with, what I have open right now is the IMDb synopsis, the Sparknotes synopsis, and the Wikipedia synopsis. Perfect. So which one are we going to start with? Okay, so most of what I want to do, because I assume most people hopefully know the story, um, I want to actually compare and contrast 
And um, maybe if people are interested in reading the full thing and seeing you know, what's actually going on, they can look it up because we don't have a ton of time. Uh, Absolutely, that sounds great. Okay, so what I wanna talk about first is how they start off. And I have totally lost my train of thought already. All right, we're good, we're going good. So <laughs> I guess what, what I would say in terms of what not to do is to start with backstory and don't include your character in the beginning, um, which is something that I think the synopsis on Wikipedia has done poorly. Um, we have an introduction that includes Lord Voldemort, James and Lily Potter, Dumbledore and McGonagall, Rubius Hagrid, and Vern Vernon and Petunia Dursley, and, their and Dudley. And Harry's barely mentioned. He's a baby, and then he's, he's taken places. So these are things that are, um, it is the start of the book, but it's about other people first. The IMDb synopsis is talking about Lord Voldemort has just been defeated because he tried to kill Harry Potter and the curse rebounded upon him. And Harry has these things happen to him rather than these things are just happening. Um, I, I hope this is making sense. Um, I'm not very good with preparing example talks. So, <laughs> all right, I got a thumbs up. This is good. So in terms of a synopsis that's done really well, I actually want to say that the Sparknotes synopsis is pretty good. If you're still in school, using Sparknotes for things is bad. Don't do that. Um, but if you're using it just to, you know, maybe get some writing examples, I think they do synopses very right. And this is true not just of the Harry Potter books, but of pretty much anything on Sparknotes um, that I found throughout my very lazy school career. Don't be me, it's bad. Uh, <laughs> I adore you. You're so funny. But that is a really great point. If you are studying how to write a synopsis, check out Sparknotes because that really is what that is. So if you are doing an in-depth study to see what is working and what is not working and how to do it really well, that's a great place to go to look for examples. Right, definitely. And I think something else that you can learn from Sparknotes is not just from um, the synopsis that's short, which would be the plot overview on their page, but also in the summary and analysis section, if you go, it has like chapter by chapter and you read a summary of that chapter and you see if you can compare and contrast that with the overview and see what events made it into the major synopsis and what events are only put in when they have a lot more space to work with a, a shorter amount of content. But anyway, that's fantastic. Thing. I love that because that really gives you the ability to go and look and see what is important enough to have within the synopsis and what is maybe a more minor detail that we don't need. So I love that. Great suggestion. Yeah, definitely. Um, so one thing that I also think the Sparknote synopsis does really well, um, actually all three of these synopses do this, is that they have one paragraph about the events of Harry's childhood and where he's taken. Um, and then the second paragraph starts with something like 10 years later. So you've given us an idea of how much time has passed, what has changed without, you know, talking about this. Because obviously he's had this terrible life. He's been bullied. He's been treated poorly by his aunt and uncle. And we, we kind of, we get an idea of that by how we hear they treat them or how, how we hear they treat him later, but we don't need to know all of the events in between. Um, so they don't fall into backstory traps, which is good. And then another thing that I think Sparknotes does particularly well, um, and I know we talked about the, the when of your story, the timeline of your setting being something to mention only if it has a very serious bearing on the plot. Um, but that is something that's true of each of the Harry Potter books. They take place over the course of one school year, um, and it's good to know the progression of that year and, and when things happen. So we have um, stuff like as the school year gets underway on Halloween for Christmas a few weeks later, um, and then we get the idea that we have gone from the beginning of the school year when everything's sort of new to um, the end of the school year when he when he confronts Voldemort and that's sort of the I guess the um, format of all of those books um, and it's laid out actually very well in a lot of these synopses so 
Um, I, I guess the biggest thing I can recommend if you're struggling with, with writing a synopsis that you've never done before is to look up examples. Um, I know that there are examples floating around of like the Lunar Chronicles synopsis. There are examples um, of a lot of movies um, that you can find out there. But I, I would definitely recommend SparkNotes. Um, I would not probably recommend IMDb because a lot of their synopses have been written just by viewers um, and members of their site. I'm sorry, I have to cough. <coughs> Yeah, as far as that goes, a lot of people are writing that, and they can change that, and they can edit that, so that may not necessarily be the best example for you, so maybe stick more to spark notes and things like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, if if something has a more academic bent, obviously it's going to be a better source. Um, so hopefully, I mean, that was definitely short and sweet regarding my examples, but like I said, I kind of suck at preparing this part, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was fantastic. So. Tell me, we are getting close to the end of our episode today. I know we're going to open up to questions in a few minutes, but before we do that, are there any last suggestions, tips, hints, tricks that we need to be aware of when we are writing a synopsis? Um, you know, I think I've covered pretty much most of it. Um, I have one inevitable question that I feel like I get asked every time. Um, should I just go over that now, or should we wait and see if it's asked? <laughs> oh, gosh. I feel like... Here's what we'll do. Here's what we'll do. We are going to open it up to questions now. So over in the chat box on the right, there is a place for you to be asking questions. I know we're chatting as we go. Um, go ahead and use the red question mark check box so that we know what is a question and what is just comments. And let us know what questions you have. And while you are doing that, we are actually going to go ahead and answer this one because we're pretty sure this is coming. So Anna, tell us what this inevitable question is while everybody's writing their questions, and then we will see what everybody else has to say. Okay, so this is a question that I actually had myself uh, for a very long time until I sort of started working in the industry and started understanding it. Um, if the synopsis is a tool to help sell your book, why can't, make it, why can't you make it another tool to make people want to read the book by raising questions? It's not a second query, um, but... I think a lot of people approach it that way and a lot of people maybe not maybe aren't totally clear on why that's bad um and i i think i've outlined a couple of those points throughout the presentation but i have a, a pretty um concise written answer to it and it's regarding the way we know whether the whole book is a good fit for us um rather than just the parts that you choose to introduce to market yourself um so if I am reading a synopsis and you have picked and chosen the points that you think will be a good fit for me, that's great. I'm going to think it's a great fit and I'm going to go read your book. But if I then find out that your book has things that aren't going to be a good fit, things that you had chosen to leave out, even if I really loved the synopsis or if I really loved the book, um, it really sucks to receive one of those submissions, spend hours reading it, and then like get to the end and find out it's actually a terrible fit because of the ending, which was left out of the synopsis. Um, and it's, I mean, it's just a, mostly a business decision, something that um, maybe your ending just doesn't fit with what we're looking for. Like I work for a romance publisher and maybe you don't have a happily ever after in your category romance. That's not going to fit. And I need to know that up front. Even if your book is fantastic, it's not going to be something that I can, um, accept because then I have, you know, broken some rules and all of that good stuff. And those are, you know, hours that I have spent reading your book, even if it's a great book that I really should have spent reading other queries, reading other people's manuscripts. And also it's time wasted for you that you're being strung along while I read your book and, and we go through this process, but it's ending up as an auto decline, which is something that I could have found from the synopsis the day after you submitted your query. So, yeah, that's a really good point. So save time for them, save time for yourself. Make sure you have everything in that synopsis so that we are not wasting time and you do not get strung along and they do not get strung along because that's kind of not fair. It's something that they cannot have, even if it's a really great book and they love it right up until the end when they figure out that they cannot have it. That's not nice to string them along and waste their time like that. So, right. all right, so let's take a look. We've got some questions here. And we're going to get those answered and wrapped up. We're a few minutes over, which is awesome because I love it when we run over a little bit. So, guys, right. stick with us. Um, okay. 
So our first question is, what is the most typical size for a synopsis? So if people are asking for a specific size, which is the most typical have you found within different publishers um, size-wise as far as pages or word count goes? Is there a typical size that people ask for that maybe we should focus on just a little bit more? Or is it kind of anything goes depending on what it is? I think it just depends on the publisher. Um, unfortunately, I don't really have a solid answer for that. I'd say the most common that I've seen is probably 300 words, but it's so spread out that that's like a tiny majority, you know? So it's, it's something that you just have to, um, you know, be specific about who you're submitting to. So. Gotcha. That makes sense. Okay. So we want to know what specifically should we include as far as world building goes? I know you said don't include a lot because that really is supposed to be the beginning of your story that introduces us to this world. But are there specific elements that maybe we should put in or should we pretty much stay away from that within a synopsis? Um, I think there are specific elements that you should put in. Um, for one, if the world is different from the world that we know and there are major differences. So we have a story that's 10 years in the future and maybe um, maybe cell phones no longer exist. That's kind of an important detail that we're gonna maybe through the synopsis, when people are talking to each other, wonder like, why can't they just make a phone call? Tell us that up front. Or if we're in a fantasy world, if we're not on earth, tell us where we are, that kind of stuff. But if you're, if you're just, um, you know, writing about modern New York, just say you're in New York and we'll assume that it's modern New York, that kind of stuff. Fantastic. Okay, so we want to know a little bit more about the middle. So we talked about the beginning, the middle, and the end, and we want to have everything included in there. Should we have more of the middle and a little bit less of the beginning and the end, or is it kind of very straightforward, you just go through the entire thing? I think it should definitely be straightforward. Um, you shouldn't be dwelling on any certain parts. Obviously, there's going to be more detail probably regarding your ending because that's when things pick up and more things start to happen uh, in a typical story. But otherwise, it's going to correspond to the, I guess, the density of that part of your book. Um, so if you can, if you can take your book and chapter by chapter say whether this is beginning, middle, or end, and then look at like percentages and then look at how much of your synopsis is beginning, middle and end, make those match, you know? Perfect. That's good to know. All right. So then we're going to wrap this up with one final question. Um, and guys, I know lots of questions are coming in. We've got lots of things that we could be asking. Um, feel free to leave those messages for us or comment in the comment box if you're watching the rebroadcast and maybe we can do some extra videos for you guys. Um, but Anna, is there a specific time when we should be writing our synopsis? Should we write it before we write the book? Should we write it as we're writing the book? Or is that something that you typically do after you're done writing? It's definitely something that you typically do after you're done writing because it would suck to have an outline, write your synopsis, and then halfway through writing your actual book, you're like, well, crap, this is all different now. <laughs> um, so your synopsis is something that you want to pull from your finished product because it needs to be a representation of the final book that you are submitting to me. That kind of stuff. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you so much, Anna. And guys, thank you for all of your questions. Again, keep chatting in the chat box. We will try to handle everything at all, uh, later. Maybe we can get a blog post or something. Um, but we are going to wrap this up for today because we are just a little bit over on time, which again, I totally love because it means we've got lots of really great information that we gave to you today. And of course, we do not want to leave you empty handed. Every single week we give you a freebie downloadable bonus and we have a checklist to make sure that you have everything that is important within your synopsis. So that will be emailed out to you tomorrow. If you are not on our show notes newsletter, make sure you jump onto show notes that readingtransforms.com. That'll get you signed up for our weekly show notes. And we will go further in depth with what we talked about in the lesson, give you a bonus, and give you some extra things that are really going to help you out along your journey. Anna, thank you so much for joining us. This has been incredible. And I truly hope you will come back for more because we already know we want you back next year for some amazing episodes. Yeah, definitely. I'll be glad to come back. And I've had a great time. So thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> we always love it when you come on because you're highly amusing and so knowledgeable. <laughs> I hope that's a good thing. 
That's, it's a very good thing. It's a very good thing. We love having you on. <laughs> I love hanging out with you too because you and I talk all the time, but we don't always get to talk face to face. So this is a lot of fun yeah. for me. <laughs> and hey, before we go, I just want you to do a little um, wrist thing there and kind of show us what you oh, got God. going on. Um, <laughs> okay. So this is from a video game called Overwatch, and I got this on Friday. Um, it's now Sunday, and I'm super excited about it. And it's getting a little twisted because of like the way I'm turning my arm, but here we go. <laughs> here we go, all right. It's super nerdy, I'm a huge nerd, so if you guys are, are gamers or, or fantasy readers, I'd be glad to connect on that level as well. Um, I can talk about it for ages, so. <laughs> Listen, guys, I don't know much about video games, but Anna keeps me educated. So when I actually <laughs> came into, <laughs> I actually came into a situation over the summer where I really needed to know these things, and I knew what I was talking about, and I impressed everybody. So I owe you for that one. Oh my gosh! All right, good. I'm glad I'm good. For <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. This is what happens when you're friends with us. We just talk about all sorts of fun things. <laughs> Oh my gosh, yes. We sat in like the prep room for this and talked about humidity and hair. And <laughs> we did. We looked up the weather. It was great. <laughs> it's so much fun when we just get to hang out when we're not on camera. You guys should see us. It's awesome. <laughs> but anyway, awesome. we're going to wrap this up. <laughs> we're going to wrap this up. Thank you guys so much for joining us. This has been an awesome episode. Um, this is our last episode of 2016, so we'll be coming back to you in January with brand new episodes, brand new guest stars. It's going to be amazing. If you've totally loved this, jump on to www.readingtransforms.com where you have access to our online courses, our online communities, the resources and tutorials and the videos that we're working on over at Reading Transforms and the amazing projects that we have going on within our different societies and communities on Reading Transforms. You can also jump into community.readingtransforms.com, which will take you to our closed Facebook group. I'm in there every day teaching on marketing, branding, and social media strategy. And we are working on overcoming those pesky algorithms that are bogging down all of your posts and keeping your fans from seeing what you are putting out there. So I would love to see you there. It's so much fun. We've got a great group, super supportive, and I would love to have you as one of our members. Now, if you are hanging out with me um, in the Reading Transforms communities, you know right now we have a very special uh, project going on. It is one of our free online courses. It's called Strategizing Author Success, How to Crush Your Author, Author Brand Next Year. We are on day seven of this, and we are planning 2017 for our authors. We're dealing with social media. We're dealing with our in-person signings. We're dealing with all sorts of things that you need in the new year. We have 14 major topics that we are dealing with and planning out together as a group. And I have absolutely loved hanging out with you guys if you are a member of that and joined us with this process. It's been so much fun. So you are uh, seeing some really cool stuff in there if you are a part of that with us. Now, one last shout out, if you are watching live, this will not affect you if you are watching the rebroadcast, but if you are watching live with us tomorrow night, we are doing one special, um, nope, I can't even talk today. We're doing one special final presentation of our newsletters for author webinar. So um, tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we are doing newsletters for authors, which is our free masterclass. We're talking about five things that you as an author should have in each and every one of your newsletters that will help you to engage your fans and really get them connected with your newsletter, which you know is your most important piece of communication with your fans because it is not social media. No one can dictate what you do when you send things out. You do not have a word count. You are totally limitless with your newsletter and it is your most important and effective tool of communication with your fans. So I hope you'll join us for our final webinar of this masterclass. This was not actually planned. I wasn't planning on doing this for a couple of months, but I had a group of authors contact me a couple of days ago and specifically ask for this. So we open this up one more time for you guys, and I hope you will join us. You can find that at newsletters4authors.readingtransforms.com. That, in case you caught my little weirdness there, that was newsletters for authors readingtransforms.com and you can get signed up for that. I hope to see you there tomorrow night. Thanks so much for joining us. This has been a fantastic episode and we will see you guys in the next year. Stay inspired. Hey authors, I know that marketing your book can be so confusing, especially when you don't have a big budget to work with, but I want you to know that there are ways that you can market your book without costing you a cent. 
I have come up with a list of 20 totally cost-free marketing ideas that you can implement into your marketing strategy and see the same great results that my own authors have seen when they implemented it into their marketing plan. You can get your very own totally free copy of how to market your book creatively and effectively even when you're flat broke if you jump on to www.readingtransforms.com. Up near the top you're going to see a spot where you can download it completely for free. It is my gift to you. I hope that you take this PDF and you use it in your marketing strategy and see incredible results and I can't wait to see what you do with it. I'm KM Robinson of KM Robinson Photography and Reading Transforms. Stay inspired. Do you have a new book releasing soon? Do you want to create a unique experience for your fans on your book release day? Do you want to interact with your fans, celebrate your book, and be the talk of the industry? Book launch live events bring all this and more right into your grasp. Rita Award winner and New York Times bestselling author Pin Tip Dunn called it the highlight of my release day. Dying to find out if this is for you? Visit booklaunchlive.readingtransforms.com for more info and see if this is the perfect thing for your release day. Do you ever feel like you're alone in the book world? When the conferences die down and you're sitting in front of your computer alone writing your next manuscript, things can seem very isolated. But they don't have to be. Do you ever feel like social media changes are getting the better of you? Do you feel like you need support that you just don't have? You don't have to be on your own trying to solve the algorithms. Join the Reading Transforms community for a group of authors and book world professionals going through the same things as you. Connect and support one another. Hear from industry leaders on technology changes and get the latest updates on RTTV, the weekly live broadcast that teaches you to market your books and brand yourself more efficiently and creatively. Get the community and support that you've been longing for and surround yourself with authors just like you. We'll see you there.